Good morning and afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all today. Welcome to Cybersecurity Office Hours. Uh, I am Tara Wheeler. I'm the CEO of Red Queen Dynamics. We've been doing this for a while now, and it is always a joy and a pleasure to have friends and allies and amazing people join us to answer your questions today about managed service providers and the small businesses they love so, so, so much. <laughs> Um, I am thrilled today to be joined with a dear friend and colleague. I mean, just just honestly, a wonderful friend. Um, this is Chris Weisopel, known to many of you as Weld Pond, uh, the distinguished luminary who bought me a very good bottle of scotch for my 40th birthday, and a human being that I would love to introduce to you all further. <laughs> um, and before we do this, before I read this bio, Chris, how did your bio get generated today? <laughs> so uh, Tara was looking for a bio and I said, just use what's up on LinkedIn. And then I looked at it and it was five paragraphs. And I said, no, that's too much. So I just put it into chat GPT and said, make this a hundred words. So let's see. Let's see if it embarrasses me or not. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, and here we go. <laughs> let's go ahead and pop this up here. Um, I am also hearing maybe that some folks might not be able to see me on video, which I'll check that really quickly. Um, to make sure that it's working. All right, so I'm gonna stop and restart my video. Just so now you're just stuck with me and hopefully Tara can come back. Uh, um, but uh, I hope you like my poinsettias. I, I got them specifically for this event because I, I wanted to be a little bit, little bit more holiday and Christmassy. Because look at her beautiful tree in the background. I wish I had a tree. <laughs> Hopefully the uh, the video came back up there again for me. So uh, always fun uh, figuring out the the joys of the internet as we do this live. Um, yeah. So Chris uh, is a cybersecurity luminary, renowned for his pioneering work. And I didn't just say that. Chat GPT said that. So you know that it's not hallucinating anything. He began his career at Loft, where he conducted groundbreaking vulnerability research from 1992 to 2000. Notably, he exposed a critical flaw in the Windows NT networking stack. I mean, on that one, just thank you for your service. Chris co-developed Loftcraft, Loftcrack, a pioneering Windows password cracking tool, and spearheaded the shift from anarchistic full disclosure to coordinated disclosure in the security community. He testified before the U.S. Senate in 1998 and the U.S. House in 2003, offering expertise on software vulnerability discovery during the rise of Internet worms. Embracing the secure by design ethos, Chris served as VP of research at At Stake, working closely with Microsoft and authoring The Art of Software Security Testing. In 2006, he founded Veracode, a SaaS solution automating secure software design principles, now serving a global clientele. Chris leads Veracode's security research, product security, information security, and compliance teams, revolutionizing software security. Do you have time to go get coffee? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do. I do. I have a lot of great people that work with me. <laughs> <laughs> so you just go get the coffee at this point. I just get the coffee right and say, attaboy. <laughs> uh, that's that's non-trivial. And, and folks, you know, we're going to talk today about something that Chris and I have been paying some, some close attention to. Um, which are FTC regulations impacting especially um, kind of the, the middle of the normal curve of managed service providers today. But I actually do want to talk at least a little bit about that. We joke about going and getting coffee, um, but Red Queen Dynamics is still a small business. And honestly, we were doing a great onsite last week in Vegas. My job every day when the team had kind of packed up and gone back to rest was vacuuming the room, right? Um, and, and cleaning up after us as we kind of operate on a budget. There's something to be said for being the person who empties the trash cans, I think, every day. And it's non-trivial to make people feel supported and appreciated. Um, and I think, Chris, you've been somebody that people have spoken about again and again as somebody who does that, who orders the pizza and has just no pride, right? There's there's an element of just no pride and no shame in, in being somebody who's a leader in InfoSec. If you were going to offer some thoughts for people that feel, I think, really frustrated at this point um, when dealing internally and especially with clients, with information security, how do you um, how do you project that concept of servant leadership, of being somebody who's trusted and trustworthy um, in a way that somebody else could take real lessons from? Yeah, so I guess um, I, I've been gifted with uh, a sense of optimism. I think that really helps in a field where you're constantly finding problems. 
it's like, oh, you're finding problems or someone has come to you that they found a problem, right? And that's just sort of the daily grind of, of anything security, whether it's compliance or product security or you're, you're, you're a security engineer or you work in the SOC, um, you're doing incident response. Uh, there, there's always yet another, another thing. Um, and you just have to sort of be optimistic, like we're going to get through this. We're going to improve. Um, you know, I, I think things have their ups and downs and I always like to have a, you know, a, 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 a positive, positive attitude that I can bring to, to, to situations. And, um, I, I think one of the things that's depressing a lot of times for security people is the gap between, you know, where we are and where we, where we want to be. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I kind of learned this back, you know, this is back going back to the loft days. It's like, no matter where you are, like raise the bar, d improve. I know, um, Red Queen Dynamics has this, uh, mentality of, of nudging you to constantly be a little bit better, but that little bit is maybe only takes like a few hours or something or even less. So, um, I, I, I think when you, you, you think about it, if I'm, if I'm constantly improving, even if it's just a little bit and it's here and there, you're just going to, you're going to get to where you need to be, um, ultimately. And, and I, I know that's, that's possible, right? So that's why I, I have a positive attitude because I've done it. I know it's possible. So that's what I try to instill in the people around me. I love that you came out the other side of all that. <laughs> with a positive attitude, with with optimism, and I feel like that's a journey that we all get to pick in infosec and and working in IT. And I feel like people end up at the end of 25 years in this field and in this career, either thinking to themselves, "God, that was exhausting. I don't ever want to do that again." And people are awful, or "God, that was exhausting. I have got to find a way to make this better for everybody." Right? Like there's just this kind of element in you. I think you come out of the the end of that either. Um, with this super dangerous feeling that you know that that people can't be trusted with their own computers, um, and that you know you've got to kind of just turn everything off. The house of no in security is often what we call it. Or you end up being somebody who um, is filled with joy with technology and um, and the fun that it can bring. And like, I see a lot of people super annoyed and irritated with Chat GPT. So I have a very dear friend. Um, and this is just a new way to use some of this stuff. I've got a very dear friend who um, I was I was writing his I was writing a referral for one of his positions. He just got a new job, and all of a sudden they sprang a requirement on him. Hey, you know I need a I need your your referral um, in 24 hours. And I was like, brother, I've got seven minutes. Literally from this moment on, um, I, I said I would do it. I can I can do it. Let's jump on Zoom. I took his CV, I fed it into ChatGPT, and I said, write me an effusive recommendation letter for a trusted colleague with all of the relevant parts in it, summarizing his career, and saying uh, with an element of snark and respect at the end uh, that I wouldn't hire anybody else. Y'all, the thing just chucked out this formulaic, formulaic letter. I altered three lines in it and submitted it in six minutes. Uh, ChatGPT is a wonderful tool for something like that, for that kind of formulaic um, but required personal touch where you need a template, right? Like give me a bio that's a hundred words instead of 50, um, instead of all of what I was looking at. That's it, that was amazing. It's amazing that we can do this. And what's more, I know that the things that I just read were true in that bio. Uh, yeah. So I, I, find it, I find it wonderful that we're beginning to start to use some of these tools. I, there's a lot of grumpiness around, um, I'm not gonna call it AI because we've been using AI effectively, spicy statistics and applied statistics for 35 years. Right, like um, utilizing applied statistics to do things like provide probabilities on signature matching in antivirus. That's the exact same statistical probabilities and, and processes we're using now in antivirus. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do you do you think that maybe there's an element here of fear of the new and a need for retraining in infosec, which is so crazy? We all have to train, you know, ourselves again every 12 months anyway. Is there fear happening here? Uh, you know, I, I, I think these, these, these tools, especially the generative AI tools, um, are, are going to impact every part of cybersecurity. Um, and, uh, but I, I think, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, it's going to take away my job as your first reaction. Um, I, I, you know, I, 
again, I'm going to take the optimistic approach is it's going to make your job. It's going to make your job better. I mean, the example you just gave is, you know, you didn't have to spend all this time writing that letter. You could go on and do other things. Um, and, and you let that, it, it basically was like your, your junior writer, right? Which you gave an assignment to, uh, who doesn't want to, you know, a junior doc writer to help, help them present their ideas and, you know, whatever reports or information they need to present to somebody who, who wouldn't want that as an assistant, right? Like, that's great. Well, you have one now, right? Um, and, and I think it just gets, you know, it can get rid of a lot of the boring, um, the boring tasks um, that frankly, a lot of people don't want to do. Like a lot of people don't want to be like junior SOC engineers, right? We can't fill these positions. And if we do, they want out of that position in a year. They're like, I got my experience. I, I want to be a senior person. I don't want to be looking at these reports, right? Or I don't want to be generating these reports. Um, so I, I think a lot of the positions that we find in cybersecurity that are hard to fill, hard to hard, hard to retain are exactly the kind of positions that are going to get done by the, you know, done by the machine. You know, and some of the stuff that I'm doing um, at Vericode is, um, you know, generating reports of bugs in code that need to be fixed. Guess what? Developers don't want to fix bugs in code. <laughs> so you're, you're just create, you're creating work, right? It's like, it's necessary work, but we're creating work. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if we can use generative AI to actually fix the bug, right? It knows how to write code. Why can't we train generative AI to fix the bug. And that's one of the things we did at Vericode. So, you know, we're getting rid of a lot of work that people don't want to do. I'm not getting rid of developer jobs by helping them fix security bugs. They don't want to do that anyway. I'm just making more secure products. So I think that's the kind of mentality we have to have towards this stuff. Uh, I, I absolutely love that. And it lets us also start to get into the conversation. Hey, Lesek, how are you doing? Um, good evening from Germany. Speaking of EU AI regulation, I'm just going to use that as a casual segue. Um, we just saw a day ago some new AI regulation popping out um, that some people are are kind of gnashing their teeth over. Some people are... Um, are, are happy about, at least because we're starting to look at the world of regulation and AI, um, without going too far into the specifics of the EU's uh, desire to regulate AI, I think there's often um, an attempt by policymakers to regulate some of the things that they may not necessarily understand or haven't personally experienced the consequences of. So I, I've seen this happen a couple of times um, so far, and I know you've, you've certainly seen this as well too. Um, I've seen the EU regulate, I've seen, we've all seen um, elements of things like the, the online safety bill um, in, the, uh, in the UK, and we're seeing some initial attempts to regulate AI in the United States. It's almost like certain kinds of regulation are, are falling unnoticed. Um, as we have the more kind of mm -hmm. exciting, intriguing world of regulating AI. But at the same time, I think the regulations that we've seen the FTC put out recently are going to have a far greater impact on about half of American businesses. And you and I were, were starting to talk about this. Um, folks, I, I pasted up in the comments up at the top. It's the same FTC link that, that came up briefly in a conversation with me and James Byerly last week. Hey, James, how are you doing? Um, which is about the fact that um, the FTC put a regulation out on October 27th of this year, just six weeks ago, saying that all non-banking financial institutions in the United States uh, would have to report the loss of more than 500 customers' data in 30 days or less to the FTC. The most important thing about this is that there is no limitation on the size of the company that has this regulation enforced on it. I, I wanna really emphasize that. Non-banking financial institutions include mortgage brokers, payday lenders, used car lots, construction companies. Anytime you've ever had your credit processed by a business, that is a non-banking financial institution in the United States. That means retail companies that offer their own uh, credit granting process. You ever had a, a kitchen remodeled? If you had a kitchen remodeled and you did credit to process that uh, initially, that's what that looks like. That's a non-banking financial institution. So I don't know about you, but I am just trying to imagine the reality of used car dealerships 
um, in the middle of the country, not understanding that these regulations apply to them. And so I guess, you know, I, I warned you in advance, we wanted to talk about this. It seems dry until you get really into it and go, my God, this is something that's going to impact every small American business, um, at, at, at least initially, if not at one remove. What do you think? You know, it's interesting. When I was reading the regulations, well, the thing that came to mind for me was how this happened with um, doctor's offices and dentist offices at, for, for HIPAA, right? It didn't, it didn't matter how small that office was. It could be a, a, single, a single doctor but they have patient information, right? And, 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 and so, and that, and that's, that's what we're trying to protect. So it's not, it, it, it wouldn't make sense to just like protect your patient information at a large regional hospital or a, a, a large, a large medical uh, insurance company, a uh, health insurance company, when it can be stolen at the doctor's office. Right. Um, and, and so it's kind of the same way with, with financial information, you know, um, I think the, the authority for this FTC comes from the Graham Greeley Bliley Act, which was set out to protect financial in, in, in information. And, um, you know, it's interesting that we said, well, you know, if financial information is at these small businesses, it doesn't really doesn't matter as much. Um, and it, it just doesn't just doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, and, and so I, I think this this does make a lot of sense. The challenge is these organizations are not sophisticated, right? They don't have compliance teams, right? Um, and I think they, they're going to need help from service providers, just like, you know, doctor's offices get help from service providers so they can comply with, with HIPAA. The same thing's going to happen to people who, you know, process financial information at places that give, give, give credit, like you're, you're, you're talking about. So, um, from a consumer protection, it makes perfect sense. From the provider's pro provider's side, um, or the business's side, they're like, I've never had to think about compliance before, right? Um, and and you're making me do something. You're making me do something new. So um, I think this is going to take a while for organizations to you know get 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 grips with this. Just like doctors' offices, it took them a while before. You know, now they now they stick a tablet in front of your face and give you a wall of text to to then click something, right? Yeah. But it took it took a while to get to to get to that point. So um, I, I think that's where we are now, right? We're just starting with the, this new regulation. There's four and a half months until this rule comes into effect. What do you think the first companies are that are going to be affected by something like this? Um, well, I mean, the, some of the things you talked about um, definitely like auto dealers seems like a big one, like a, a huge part of their business is, is credit. Um, they, even small dealers certainly have more than 500, um, loans that they've processed recently. So, um, I, I think it's, I, I, th those are some of the obvious ones, um, that, that it's going to hit now, you know, um, putting my, putting my, um, my nefarious hat on, um, you know, sometimes I think th this, this makes, uh, you know, the attackers kind of wake up and, and notice, notice things. So, uh, I, 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 I think that's sort of the, the, the flip side is we might actually see some more ransomware headed, headed this way. We've already started to see like, you know, the fact that you're not complying with something as a threat to pay, to pay ransomware. There was a company that was threatened um, they were going to go blow the whistle to the SEC because they, you know, that, that, that was just another thing to pull on. So ransomware is bad everywhere. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this, this, this regulation is put into place. We see ransomware hitting uh, small businesses because they're soft and, and e easy targets. Um, and, and so uh, I think that's a factor that you, you have to look into. And these businesses, they should want to protect themselves from from that, but that's not always the initial reaction. Yeah, I've heard, um, and, and I looked at the the text of the ruling, and the the language is thirty days from the discovery of a breach involving five hundred people oh. or more. Um, do you think this might incentivize some small businesses to cease their cybersecurity efforts in order to prevent the discovery of the loss of data? Well, you know, whenever I read these regulations, I always do put into the back of my head that that means they can detect that when this when this happened. 
Um, I, I think with the rise of ransomware, um, you know, you don't even have to detect it. The the attackers tell you what they did, um, which you know, from an old school, you know, you know, uh, you know, security guy from from the '90s, like the idea that hackers would tell you what they just did just didn't didn't come into the the the, the playbook. Um, but you know, as we've seen the last ten plus years, ransomware, you 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 will know. Um, when when it when it when it happens a lot of a lot of the t a lot of the time so I don't think you can really bury bury your head and 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 you know turn the logging off if if you will. Mm -hmm. I I agree with you. I also see there's a very specific piece of language which says unencrypted customer data, and I'm wondering if this is something that might mean that people who don't believe that their customer data has been acquired been acquired in an unencrypted fashion. Um, my and this is this is actually a good way to word this, I think, uh, because the the offensive security mindset that both you and I have look at this and go, okay, well, a small company could just say it was ransomware, um, and so it wasn't acquired in an unencrypted fashion. I think the the policy is actually pretty well written because I think we share customer data in an unencrypted form with a hundred organizations: Dropbox, Microsoft, Google, all the organizations that that businesses share their customer data with. Um, that's not considered a data breach, right? So I think it's actually pretty well worded. And at the same time, I think the most effective form of ransomware is the one where uh, they've got the data and you've got it uh, um, encrypted and don't have access to it, but they're able to release uh, chunks of customer data to you in an unencrypted fashion to demonstrate that they have it. So that's that's always been the most effective form of, of ransomware. And other than that, it's it's farming for, um, for problematic lack of addressing of CVEs probably. Um, does that make some sense? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about, you know, did, was the data encrypted or not, um, is it's actually hard to have the data encrypted everywhere. Like a lot of people will say, yeah, we, we, we have an encrypted file system or we have an encrypted database. But when you think about it, a lot of the stuff has a workflow that touches many different people. Um, and sometimes it's, it, it, it bridges between different systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's, sometimes it's hard to make sure that things are encrypted anywhere. And, and, and attackers are really good at finding that, you know, that middle piece where things are you know, like sort of the temporary directory <laughs> where things sit in an unencrypted form. So, um, you know, unless you know you're encrypted end to end um, everywhere, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have to worry about this. Um, so as we, as I, I'm going to start to dig a little bit more into the liability issues that managed service providers end up facing. Um, let me just encourage everybody watching, please feel free to throw questions at us because your questions are the, the reason that we do this. Um, I always love to have these conversations with amazing people. We try to sort of go um, week by week. Um, every other week is a, is a luminary of cybersecurity. Um, every other week is a service provider of some kind who, who's facing these, these problems on an everyday basis. Um, and that I think helps to keep everything pretty grounded. So ask your questions if you've got them, throw them up here in the chats, either on YouTube or on LinkedIn Live. Um, we are thrilled to ask and, and answer and also just to listen to people that have got a perspective on this as well, too. Um, one of the things that I heard as I was talking to um, a customer of ours a week and a half ago was, is this new regulation going to make um, the ability of small businesses to get cyber insurance um, more difficult. And talking to a cyber insurance broker that we have a partnership with, our, our customers who are doing well on compliance get prioritized in terms of time for the process and, and uh, renewal of their cyber insurance uh, cyber insurance policies. Um, the answer is hell yeah, absolutely. It's going to make it more difficult. MSPs and MSSPs are already difficult to insure because they're not only um, uh, insuring their own data, but they're also protecting a bunch of, of small businesses. And I'm hearing that MSPs and MSSPs are having a harder and harder time getting cyber insurance themselves. Do you think that this ruling means that small businesses are going to try to offload, to, to transfer this risk onto their MSP by demanding, you know, certain kinds of, of uh, service levels and guarantees from their MSP that transfers the risk onto them? Um, and if so, how's that any different than me telling my accountant, hey, it's your fault if I screw up my taxes? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of a, I don't know, that sounds like a hard sell to me. I, I think transferring risk by getting insurance, um, 
you know that 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 certainly helps but of course that 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 costs that costs money um i think the same thing would be with the mssps if you want them to to take on some of this risk um you're gonna have to you have to pay them more like there's no i don't think there's any free ride here um where you can transfer risk without it becoming more expensive um and so you know i i think the insurance market is pretty interesting right now because they are taking uh, a deeper and deeper look at um your your compliance and your controls and how well you've documented and what you can communicate to them and i've, I've kind of learned a uh a a a, a stealth or a backdoor question to find out how someone what their security posture is like. You ask them, "Have your cyber insurance rates gone up?" <laughs> and um, because in general rates are going up, uh, but if you have the but but at the same time the insurance companies are scrutinizing people's controls and compliance documentation, um, and so if your rates are going up. It's just it's because you don't have the controls to demonstrate to the insurance company that um, you're you're mitigating their risk. Um, so if you ask someone if their rates are going up, and they say yes, you're like, oh, I don't want to put my I don't want to put my data with that company. Um, so it, it's an interest it's a, it's an interesting dynamic that's uh, that's happening right now. So if you don't want to disclose that you have poor security, don't talk about your cyber insurance rates. Uh, our cyber insurance rates are remaining steady, which is lovely. Um, I, you know, honestly, I'm, I look at it and go, the cyber insurance industry um, is is coming around to the idea that they're due for a reckoning, I think, really, in terms of rates and their ability to bucket risk. And a lot of it really is, I think, um, small businesses. And I see a couple of good questions over here. I'm going to get to those in a second. I think small businesses um, often when they get those checklists, those kind of point in time checklists for their cyber insurance policies, kind of look at it, they kind of like close their eyes and hold their nose and go check yes on everything. And, and they hope and they pass it to their MSP and go, does this look good? And the MSP goes, ah, it, it looks pretty good. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty much okay with everything you just said, but that's not a guarantee of continuous compliance over time, which is a massive problem. And, and one of the reasons that we're seeing that cyber insurance policy payouts are decreasing because mm -hmm. the originally stated controls on that point in time checklist that was so burdensome and cost so much originally um, aren't, aren't relevant anymore. People didn't maintain MFA throughout the organization. Uh, they don't have password managers. They're not um, actually treating data the way that they said they would. Or maybe one person is inside the organization, but other people are busy saving client data, you know, to a personal company or personal computer's desktop. Right. Right. So it's it's an interesting challenge. Um, and that continuous compliance and demonstrating where your controls were at a point in time, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's tough. You know, we we provide that. I've seen a couple of other companies out there that are working on providing that as well. Um, but this is a world where small businesses are being expected to manage and maintain the kinds of controls that enterprises until now have struggled with. So it's it's a hard one. <clears throat> I um, I would love to start getting to a couple of these questions. Um, I'm actually going to start. Um, by look at this i love this one this is less question um <laughs> encrypted but who can access the keys um i love this question encryptions become such a checkbox item um less like I, I i talked about this a couple of times before um maybe last year in some talks i think chris might even have seen me talk about this at rsa i have seen no fewer than three small business ceos answer the question on their cyber insurance checklists what kind of encryption do you use with a single word and the word is Microsoft. Microsoft. They think they think Microsoft. And it, it, right, it's funny. And you look at it, you go, "That's funny." But wait, actually, that's not a bad answer to that question. If what you're doing is saying, "Oh, I'm I'm doing whatever," all of my stuff is in Microsoft, and I'm inheriting whatever choices Microsoft made. The problem is, I don't think they understand that. Right. That's that's the real challenge. So I guess um, you know, is there is there a way? For small businesses to even understand this requirement um, that they definitely have on a checkbox on all of their checklist items. Yeah, you know this is this is this is this is an easy one to say you're encrypted, but then basically because everyone in the organization has access to the key, or every you know everyone who's in the IT organization, or everyone who has access to any kind of administrative uh, has has access to the key, then what you're really just saying is okay, well I can compromise any employee. And you know it's not encrypted anymore. So um, 
that that that's I think it's it's hard for organizations to understand that. Um, you know, you're getting into like your data architecture and data governance, and these are sophisticated things that even a lot of enterprises, you know, don't don't do well. Um, so uh, it, it's definitely a good question to ask: is you know how many employees have access to the keys that are encrypting my data? But um, I don't think you're going to get a good answer. Uh, it's the, these are the, these are these are hard things for unsophisticated organizations to design and implement, and then even know how to do it. Um, so you know, this is why third-party compliance is, I think, important yeah. because you know, then you have someone who all they do is try to understand what what are the what are the questions that you know really matter. It's like you know, do you use encryption versus is all customer data encrypted? You know, it's like two totally different uh, quest questions. And obviously the latter one is, is, is more important. It's like, do you use MFA or, you know, is all your, all your authentication MFA? Um, and it's really easy to use MFA somewhere. It's really hard to use it everywhere. But obviously, you know, if you're not using it on the critical systems, then what's the point of using it somewhere? So, um, you know, this, you got you, you have to ask the questions correctly, and the person answering has to really understand how to answer the question, also. And I think that's totally true with this encryption question. It, it really is. And digging a little further into that, um, I often find that the question that's being asked on compliance checklists is the wrong question. Um, what's the wrongest question you've ever seen? I have an answer for this too, but I want to know what the, the what is the wrongest question. question you've ever seen phrased or given to an organization that does maybe even the the opposite or just as nonsensical of what it's intending. Well, I I think you know, do you use encryption is ridiculous, but I I don't know if any anyone would phrase the question that that way. Um, so I, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to it's hard for me to come up with something really dumb because it seems like a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. It really is. And um, the the answer that I had uh, was actually on our cyber insurance questionnaire. It's a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm the giant nerd that got us cyber insurance, not because we had to, uh, but because I thought it was a really good idea, right? And, and so I go through the process of getting a cyber insurance. And on the questionnaire, as I'm going down through this entire thing, reading it as an expert in this all the way down, there's very few times I'm going to sit here and call myself an expert in something, but I'm damn good at Excel sheets and checkboxes. And so I, I look at this list, I go down it, and, and one of the questions is, do you require that everyone in your organization change their password every 30 days? I this was that. two years ago, two years ago in November. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I hate the password thing. You know, I love pointing to the NIST, uh, you know, most recent guidance on this, which is now over five years old, which says that, you know, no, don't, don't change. Don't ever change your password. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't require complexity. Length is the only thing that matters. Um, and, uh, you know, but we're, we're so stuck because there's so many organizations that are your partners, your customers, um, and in some cases, even dumb regulators that still require this. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so many people are doing it. It's out of this, you know, regulatory inertia, right? It's on, right. it's the best practice inertia that I don't know how we're, the only way out of this is actually to totally switch to to MFA, right? Or, or, mm -hmm. or go somehow passwordless. I don't think we're ever going to get out of it. We're, 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 we're like stuck changing passwords forever. I, I, I think that most of the regulations lag best practices by at minimum five years and in a lot of cases, 10 years, genuinely. Um, and I think that one of the very few things that makes best practices change is uh, the only thing that has teeth in it. Honestly, cyber insurance is making people change. That was that was an example of, of a bad questionnaire I've seen, but honestly, uh, small businesses needing to get cyber insurance so that they can retain their uh, revenue partners, they can do revenue enablement, they can enter a supply chain, they can you know, sell to a larger enterprise and get through a vendor assessment process. I, I've never seen um, a small business that bought cyber insurance without having to do those, again, except for us because we're nerds, um, 
but I also see that cyber insurance often is the only thing that's making them upgrade and update their, their cybersecurity standards. So I think that that pushes out a little bit ahead. But I, I love Lessig's question, you know, was was yes, a failing answer to the do you make your people change passwords every 30 days? And the answer was that I discovered uh, that they didn't have form validation when I typed in my answer of hell no, this is a terrible way to go about security. Uh, and I'm absolutely not going to make anybody do this because it goes against the NIST guidelines. And nobody apparently reviewed the answer to that. They just granted me cyber insurance. I figured they saw the smart aleck answers I gave on some of the questions and were like, yeah, she's probably fine. She's fine. <laughs> I know, she's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I also love the idea that there is some sophistication in some of these questions. Um, so Deviant Olaf, who I, like everybody knows that this is my lovely husband, but he's got a great question probably because I bend his ear at the breakfast table upon occasion. I'm a, I'm a fabulous and interesting spouse. I just want you to know the compliance questions don't take more than 50, 60, 80% of our conversations. Um, but the language of the new regulation that describes a ransomware attack, I mean, does it, does it describe it as a loss of customer data or is there a breach of customer data? Is there a difference between a loss and a breach? And should one be penalized more harshly than the other or treated differently? So, um, so I guess it, it seems to me that, you know, and there is, there is some language in there I was reading where it, it, it talks about how, um, you know, the, the data when it's, you know, when it's, when it's, when it's lost. And I think when they mean lost, it's been taken by the attackers, uh, which is really means they have a copy of it. Right. Um, is it, you know, it, it could be used against, you know, and victimize, these 500 or plus people like that's that's the core that's the core of the matter right they don't, they're not doing this because of of ransomware might you know uh encrypt the data and cause the business to move to you know pay, pay, paper and pen in order to fill out their forms um which which obviously is 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 a detriment to the business but not necessarily to the people whose data is encrypted right um and it does it does talk about um, the data has to be, you know, taken from the organization and, 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 and then also taken in the clear, right? So if someone steals a spreadsheet that's encrypted, that, that doesn't count, right? So it's really taking the data out of the organization, which would be considered a breach, uh, and, um, and, and, and useful, useful to commit financial crimes against those people, right? And that's, that's, that's where the violation um, comes into play. Now, early days of ransomware, they used to just encrypt the data, but really now they take the data and then encrypt the data. So most times, because that way they can have sort of the double, the double whammy when they are trying to get you to pay up. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, sometimes organizations don't care about their data that much. Sometimes it would be, there'd be huge penalties for, um, for, for, for that data being breached. So um, it depends on the type of data the organization, but most most ransomware actors actually will 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 take will take the data if if they can. Mm -hmm. I've seen some people um, who who implemented a password manager. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of companies I spoke to. Um, at least one company I know has implemented a password manager by having an Excel spreadsheet um, that is password locked with the zip code of the company. And instead of using a password manager like one pass or like one password or last pass, um, they've shared this Excel spreadsheet with everybody in the company and they update it every so often. And I, I think the challenge we would have is everyone would agree that that is, that is encrypted data. The challenge on that is how effectively is it encrypted? And is that something that is so poorly implemented that it wouldn't pass kind of a good faith sniff test? And if so, are regulations really doing any good? If, if small businesses don't understand the difference between kind of good and bad implementations, and they say, we, we did our best, we thought this is what you wanted, um, where, where does that line get drawn? And then what's the responsibility of their, of their external compliance and IT and cybersecurity providers to educate them? Yeah, so I mean that that's 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 a challenge, right? Uh, so if it would require someone to sort of do an assessment of how they are they are storing they are storing their data in, encrypted, um, and you know 
that that means there's there's assessment work that has to happen, and, and a lot of small organizations can't afford a, a, a third a third party um, assessor. So, I mean, th that's actually physically looking at physically looking at systems and, and and processes that are that are happening, like you'd have in a SOC two or something of a of a larger organization. Um, so, I, I think this is where where it's it it, it gets to be kind of difficult. Um, you know, to, in, to enforce these things because they can say, hey, we had an encrypted spreadsheet. The data that was stolen wasn't encrypted. And unless there's sort of evidence otherwise that it was, you know, it, encrypted with a very weak key or weak password, um, you know, it, it's hard. I think it'd be hard to enforce that. You know, on the other hand, you know, if an attacker gets spreadsheets that are encrypted, you know that they're going to try to, you know, decrypt them, right? And if it's a zip code, it's going to be trivial. Right, they're they're gonna they're gonna crank up their their favorite password cracker to decrypt those. So, um, I, I think it I think it gets hard to hard to enforce those kind of things. Um, and so it's you know what's what's the size of the penalty here here? You know how much effort is someone gonna go to defend themselves against um, an an an, FT, an FTC you know yeah. uh, violation here. I love Bill Abbotson's question on this one, um, and it's it's uh, it's it's in in the two comments that he made. It's you know it's one thing to say, "Did you do this?" and another one to say, "Did you do this to X standard?" Mm -hmm. Which is is so it's incredibly important. We've talked about NIST obviously, and of course we provide um, a, the SaaS solution that lets you determine that you're continuous compliant with NIST. But that may or may not be enough for some organizations, right? That that may not be the standard that you want or need or are expected to abide by. For instance, that's not sufficient for, for organizations that are required to be compliant with HIPAA. I love the example that you brought up earlier. And I think that that the way Bill phrased this is, you know, a lot of them get into, um, into requirements, but they don't really talk about how the standards that they're expected to be using get implemented or get expected, right? Like you and I sit here and go, you know, I mean, of course, an Excel spreadsheet that's encrypted with a pin code of the zip code of the business, that's 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 a solution from 30 years ago, right? Um, but who's to say that that is not a sufficient standard? I, I think it's really important to ask ourselves the question, are um, are the third parties requiring these, these, these questions are they even aware of what the standards are? And uh, I think the answer is for many of them, maybe even most of them, no. Have you seen any any third party requirement, cyber insurance provider, vendor assessment? Who does it well? Who does this checklist well? Um, well, I do. I do love the question because the people who develop the standards have taken a long time to come up with the wording to be proper, proper and actually meaningful. So um, I love leveraging standards like that, and I think I think that's a that's a that's a great idea, um, and I, I I do think that it's not done enough. I have seen a lot of questionnaires that don't 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 leverage things like some of the NIST standards. For for instance, when they're they're there, that's what they're there for, right? It's our tax dollars paid to to create these things, and we can all use them. All businesses can use them, right? Um, the question is like that you ask is like who 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 does this well, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I, I I think it's done well at that you know at that you know SOC two level right um, which is you know fairly fairly sophisticated but you know that that stuff is all that's all available right like all that stuff is 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 public and you can look at those standards and what questions they ask. Around things like supply chain and 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 vendor vendor attestations and things like that. Um, so I, I you know I, I say go for what's available instead of just thinking that you can just come up with these questions yourself because you want to make it simple and you want to make it approachable and you want to make it friendly. Well, the problem is you might be making it so that it's meaningless. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm. I, I think the one challenge I've seen also is is a lot of the best practices for SOC two aren't public. Like, there's the standards they get published by the government, like NIST and so forth. But yeah. uh, I've not seen good SOC two, especially Type two standards, be made public because they're they're part of you know copyrighted or private material, which is often just by itself a cost barrier for organizations doing this, which is is wildly challenging. Um, and I think that cost is what people are afraid of. They should be a little more afraid of the existential nature of their business, I think, at this point. Um, and I think 
the last question we'll probably tackle today, at least uh, from kind of the audience, is the single best question I've seen so far. I, I, I love you, baby, but this is the best question. Um, do MSPs possibly have an obligation as the third party that might know about this to report if they discover it uh, when a small business has has experienced a breach like this? Well, this is this is the classic ethical ethical quandary, right? Like you have you're under NDA, you have a service agreement, you have some sort of master service agreement with your with, with your providers, um, and you expect them to up, uphold that. But on the other hand, if they're doing something that's you know illegal, right? Like they know an illegal act has been committed. Um, I believe that I'm not a lawyer. But I believe if, if 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 something illegal has happened, you have a you have an obligation um, to to report it. So you got you know there's somewhat of a conflict here um, going on, and you know this isn't something that MSPs want to get in the business of or or, or, or known for um, mm -hmm. doing. Uh, but you know you could see this in a healthcare environment, right? Like you have confidentiality agreements everywhere. But, you know, if someone is acting in an unethical way uh, or a legal way, like, I think you have to report it. So um, I, it, it'd probably be good to get some clarification yeah. from the FTC um, specifically around around the rules here. I agree, especially because most of the businesses that could be impacted by something like this are not going to have the capacity to internally handle it, which means they're going to be engaging a third party contractor anyway. This is this is incident response right here. And mm -hmm. Incident response, the most fun of all of the InfoSec proportion. Uh, the most exciting. Is so <laughs> exciting. So exciting. I, you know, I think of I think of our team and and the people at, at RQD and the phrase that keeps coming up again and again for all of us who, I, I've got a, an outsized amount of talent on this team and they're wonderful. Um, but at least in part, it's because they've all done incident response. We've all been the person someone calls on the worst day of their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think there's a lot of joy in going from the analogy given to me was being from being an EMT to going into public health, yeah. right? To be able to look at these problems and, and see them systematically and solve a chunk of them, um, you know, at a time before they ever become a, a problem, which is really joy filled. But I do think that MSPs are going to really struggle with this one because I think that they are um, very likely the organization most likely to, to be the ones discovering that a small business has had their data breach. Um, and that's that's going to be a massive challenge, right? Communicating that, explaining what happened, making sure that the, the small business even understands what the nature of the problem is. And I, I think we're going to see a really interesting set of initial prosecutions coming out of the FTC regulations in four and a half months. Mostly initially, I think, starting from businesses and organizations clearly operating in bad faith, right? Just very clearly operating in bad faith, deliberately trying not to discover, you know, they've been, they've been notified, they've been told mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't want to listen. So, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's where this is heading. I can't see a way for MSPs to get themselves out of that situation other than being the ones that do good communication and, and try to be the ones lifting small businesses out of their their compliance doldrums this is a rising tide lifts all boats this is a hard one um this is turning the yeah. screws on the bottom half of the american economy yeah i have a, I have a you know the way i i think a lot about a lot of this is um you know the current way people are using software and systems and things like that is just insecure right like you know the, the whole push from uh um, CISA around secure by design a lot of that is because it's become clear that small organizations, nonprofits, schools, small businesses don't have the capabilities of securing insecure building blocks, right? Like if you're a global bank, you can take insecure software that does something very important and wrap people and process and technology around it and meet your compliance requirements, right? That's done every day. We know it because there's a lot of insecure software out there and people have to meet their re compliance requirements. Now, um, how does a small organization um, do this? And that, that's one of the pushes for secure by design um, is, is default secure by default, right? Like why are systems not storing data encrypted all the time, right? Why, is, why do they even allow you know, non-two-factor? 
right? So, so the secure by design, I think, is like sort of the only way out of all these problems that I think we've been talking about, that these systems have to come that way. Um, but the problem is, you know, it, we're not there yet. Right. This is this is this is going to take a while. And I, and I think that, you know, these, these types of regulations kind of push us in that direction, because I think it's really the only way um, this can be done, because these small organizations can't they, they, they can't handle the complexity of, of trying to make sure they're doing all the right things um, when everything is you know open and broken by default. I, I completely agree. And I look at it and go, you, we can have all the secure by design software that we want. But if someone takes that secure by design software and, uh, you know, we can make Excel as, as safe as possible. But if someone takes a, uh, you know, a spreadsheet, locks it with an insecure password, passes it around like that's that has nothing to do with whether the software is safe. It has only to do with whether or not the people who are involved in this understand what security is and are trying to do the right thing to the best of their capacity. Um, you know, software can only be as safe as the people who are using it. It, it can't just be um, something that we try to lock down because otherwise people will come up with solutions that aren't safe, aren't secure, uh, and that work around those safety features so they can just do their jobs. And I can't blame them. Right. This is this is a hard. Yeah, I mean, it, right. So that you, you want the security to be transparent. Right. You don't want them to have to think about it or, or it, 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 it to be hard. Um, so, you know, eliminating passwords would be a great way of, of doing mm -hmm. that. Um, and so, yeah, so when we say secure by design, we have to do it in a thoughtful way um, that 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 allows people to get their jobs done even with it. And so, for example, always, you know, encrypting things on disk um, would 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 and do that in doing that in a transparent way, maybe based on some key generated from their two factor or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, something where they don't have to think about it. As soon as you let someone configure it, I want the secure <laughs> configuration or the non-secure configuration. I, I think you've you've already you've lost you've lost the game. Uh, so it's got to be like you say, it's got to be usable. These people can't think about it. Um, it can't feel locked down, um, mm -hmm. and and that's a challenge, right? There's a lot of usability challenges that go into into that. Uh, that that was a great answer, um, and I think we should stop talking about security now, Chris. And we okay. should ask the last question uh, because this is you know we we can't we can't go further into this than just saying this is about people. Um, and so, I would love to ask you the last question, which I got a chance to ask Wendy and James and other folks that have been on this before. Last question is this: If you weren't in information security, if this wasn't what you did, what you felt passion for, what you what you chose to dedicate your life to and money wasn't an object, what is the job that you would want to be doing right now? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, AI is pretty exciting. And I think we've just barely scratched the surface on the types of things that that can be can be done with it. Um, and um, I think, you know, I obviously think using AI to apply it to cybersecurity is is exciting and that you know that's something I, I, I definitely want to do. But I, I think applying it in other places um, is is what I would want to do if I you know had to throw away my cybersecurity hat. Um, and um, I, I think I mean it, it, it's kind of endless what what it can do, but I, I think I think around you know, um, something around learning and, and training and, and making, making the school experience or the college experience better is something where I would want to want to try applying it. You know, you see all these things now saying, you know, my, my son's high school just came out with a ruling like you can't use you can't use chat GPT in, in any way you know, basically for your, you know, in your, in your schoolwork. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. There's like, yes, it can't be like writing the answers to the test, but what about like helping people who have a problem organizing their notes to create a study guide? Like, would that be a great usage of generative AI? So I, I, I think creatively doing something in the, in the educational space um, would be an exciting place to be. That's awesome. I love that. Um, I think that's that's a great answer and a great way to to wrap it up today. Anytime you want to make the world better, it's it's always a beautiful thing. Uh, Chris Weisopel, thank you so much for being with us today. This was 
absolutely joy filled. I am so glad that we got a chance to answer these questions. Some of them seem so dry and, and far fetched. And at the same time, they are at the center of the questions that people are going to be asking themselves over the next five to 10 years, which is, you know, what what do we need to do about people and how do we keep people safe? It's not the data. It's always about how do we keep people safe? Um, and I love sharing that mission with you, my friend. It's It's been a real joy as always. Thank oh, you, thank everybody. You. Thank I, you so absolutely. much for having me. Of it's course. Been fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, so, folks, we are going to be off the air for the next two weeks and join you again on January 4th with Adam Shostak, who is going to join us and talk a little bit about how managed service providers can do threat modeling. It's, as always, so much fun being with you all. Thanks for asking your questions. We're here for you. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll talk with you all soon. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us.